started. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rebecca McNulty and I'll be facilitating the session today titled Confessions from OER Adopters, Implementing Open Educational Resources from the Faculty Perspective. Um, before we begin, a quick reminder that the session is being recorded for future reference. And now let me go ahead and get us started by introducing our fantastic presenters, Amanda Groff, Lana Williams, Michael Callaghan, and Sandra Wheeler, all from the University of Central Florida. So we can go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Okay. Yes, I can. <laughs> when I share my screen, it takes over the entire computer so I can no longer see uh, Zoom. All right, so thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I'm going to present first. We're going to go through a series of essentially different ways that you can incorporate OER into the classroom, but also discuss our perspective and what we went through when we were adopting or creating an OER, uh, and then follow up with um, some of the benefits that we've seen in our, our department, which has been huge, a huge impact. So we look forward to sharing that with you all as well. So, you know, to begin, I wanted to provide a quote from UNESCO because I feel like it marries well with our mission in our department, with what it is that we're hoping to do for students in our courses, not just in general education courses, but throughout the entirety of the department. Uh, and that is that there's a right to education and that it should be made available, accessible, acceptable, and adaptable. And this is something that we strive for in a variety of different ways uh, through our courses. So, you know, today we're going to show you a few examples of how we have tried to implement this idea uh, amongst our faculty in our department. So the first method I want to speak to is adopting an OER. So, you know, there's adopting, adapting, and creating. And so for me personally, I've done both the adopting and adapting, and I know my colleagues here as well have done both as well. Um, you know, the biggest question that I get when I speak to faculty about adopting an OER is the time commitment involved. And that is something you definitely need to strategize before you go and elect to have a, a, an OER uh, as your textbook for your course. Now, you know, I was looking up LibGuides. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, LibGuides is a great resource for you to learn a little bit more about the application of things like OER or open access materials into your courses. And they list uh, adopting an OER as the simplest means of, of, of having an OER in your course. Now, I do agree with this on some level um, because typically when you're adopting, you're taking the entire source, you're taking the, the books, the book in its entirety and utilizing that in your course. You're not editing, you're not doing anything to change the book. So it's, it's very similar to what we're used to as faculty where we adopt a new book, um, regardless of whether or not it's OER or a traditional textbook. Uh, the thing that takes me the longest amount of time when I am, am researching um, about potentially imp um, implementing an OER in my class is the vetting process for OERs. That can take a significant amount of time. Uh, now that OER is becoming very popular, there's a lot of things out there for you to go through. And so, you know, some tips that I'd like to give is spend the most amount of time vetting those OERs uh, because you want to have an appropriate source, a source that covers the entirety of what you're hoping to accomplish in your course. Um, so think about it as a front loaded kind of work that you need to do. So you're doing the research first and then you're actually putting it into your course. So the steps involved with adopting an OER, you know, you got to find the OER first. Like I said, that is the longest part of the process for me. And there are a ton of OER databases, and I'm going to share a few with you here shortly. 
There are processes when you go into adopting an OER. Uh, in fact, LibGuides, uh, as well as Creative Commons, provides rubrics to help you evaluate OERs to make sure that it is accomplishing the things that you need it to accomplish for your book, uh, for your class. So spend that time reviewing and analyzing. Um, you know, a great thing to do is to contact your colleagues. Say, I've found this great OER. You've taught this course before. Will you be a second set of eyes to help me evaluate what's in this to make sure it is basically everything that you need it to be? Uh, so the, the involvement process has worked really well in our department. I think, you know, when we've gone to adopting OERs, particularly in our GEP courses, we've all been highly communicative with each other, right? Like we research, we reach out, we talk to each other, we work together, uh, and that has worked exceptionally well in our department. Now, adapting an OER is different, and you've probably encountered this terminology over the course of this entire conference. So probably the more easy way to remember it is revise and remix, where you're taking existing OERs and you're basically changing it to make it fit your needs, or you're inserting some of yourself into it, or you're using the images. It's basically piecemealing together the things that work for your course and, and implementing it in your class. So you're essentially redesigning existing materials to make it fit a, technically a, a textbook format for your course. So, you know, a lot of folks think this is the most intensive. LibGuides also lists it as the most intensive um, with regards to between adopting and adapting. And it does, it does take time to figure out the parts of OERs that you do wanna utilize in your course uh, to make sure that it is fitting your specific needs for that class. So, you know, keep these two different ways or means of implementing OERs in mind that adopting and adapting are quite different with time. So your steps to adapting an OER, um, you know, it's very similar. You find existing OER materials, um, you know, utilize resources that you have available to you with your, you know, your professional communities. A lot of their, you know, anthropology, we have a lot of access to various different OERs that are out there. Um, you need to spend time determining what your um, adaption needs are. Are they only images or is it significant chunks of text? So again, plan ahead um, of when you want to adapt um, a, a, an OER for your class. So the big thing when adapting an OER, meaning you're making changes to this source, is to check its Creative Commons license. And the next couple of slides after this, I'm going to briefly discuss that and I can provide some links for you all as well. So, you know, you need to make sure that it is adaptable. If it is locked in as is, then you cannot make changes to that OER. Uh, so that's a very important step when you're doing the initial research. Before you go all the way into to making all of these changes, you need to make sure you're allowed to first. Uh, and then again, getting colleagues um, approvals with the changes, potentially what you've done um, with, you know, essentially what Lana and Mike have done too, is they put together something that we all reviewed and thought was wonderful. And so you might find that other faculty teaching your same courses in your department might want to use that book as well. So sharing is, is a really great way to get the word out about OERs in your department. So as I mentioned, the Creative Commons um, licensing is important to pay attention to when you are searching for different types of OERs to utilize in your classroom. You know, a lot of, of the OERs will have different acronyms that they will use to let you know what it is <laughs> that you need for permissions in order to utilize it. It gets very tricky that you're going to pull up some OERs and you're going to see a string of letters going across and you have no idea what those mean. Utilize the Creative Commons legends that they have out there. They can explain to you. I have a quick screenshot here uh, just to demonstrate what some of those might look like. Some places use icons, which you can see in the top part of the screen on the left. Um, so it's important to learn what those mean. Uh, the one that um, would basically put a stop to adapting an OER is when you see something called ND, non-derivatives, meaning you can't change it. So if you see an ND, you have to utilize that OER as is. Um, but there are other attributes to pay attention to as you go through the process so you don't get too far along and realize you got to start all over again. So there are a couple of great places you can go to to do your initial jumping off of looking for an OER for your classroom. Um, I'm a big fan of Pressbooks. Uh, it's a great resource. 
easily searchable. Um, you can use the QR code here, but I will tell you that um, it will take you to an advertisement first. Just skip the advertisement and then you can be in Pressbooks. Um, or you can just type directly um, into your search engine, this Pressbooks. Um, it's a great place to start and it lets you sort by licenses. So you can immediately go to the ones that you can edit or adapt for your classroom. And then here's just some other engines that you can consider that we've utilized myself personally. Um, I do like Open Oregon um, and LibreText as well are also both really great resources for you to utilize to find the right mix of books for your um, classroom. So, you know, if you're out there searching and you're trying to find the thing that really captures what it is that you do in your class and you're just not successful, there is a thing you can do. You can actually create your own OER. And that is something that my colleagues, Lana and Mike, are going to talk about now about their process and what was involved with them developing an OER for our department. So I'm going to pass it off to them. One second. There we go. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, I'm going to talk for the first part of this, and then uh, Michael will pick up on some of the things that have to do with student responses as well. So as Amanda said, that uh, Michael and I have gone through the process of making our own OER text. And uh, what I'm going to do today is just basically take you through some of the uh, pitfalls and, and benefits and things that we ended up with throughout. Uh, so one of the things that happened is we do teach a general anthropology a and 2000 introductory course, and it's in, supposed to be an introduction to all four fields of study and then with some applied aspects in there as well. Um, typically, your average textbook cost for this course is between about $75 to $125, which is a pretty good burden on uh, a student, especially on a, a limited budget. But one of the things that we found is for the majority of books that were out there, the content didn't actually fit that four fields of study approach. What we ended up with was maybe one chapter that was on uh, biological anthropology, one chapter that was on archaeology, and then the rest of it was basically an overview of cultural anthropology. And so this didn't really fit our four field approach. The other thing is what I refer to as the two-year text. We ended up finding that the majority of these texts were out and in current editions for about every two years uh, being replaced because of the amount of updating and changes that we would find. And it was interesting that the major change that was driving this was actually coming from biological anthropology and that one chapter that was actually there. Uh, the other thing that we found is that for most of these textbooks, uh, it was really difficult for faculty and the overarching kind of thing of like, well, these textbooks come with those ancillary materials. They come with like, uh, you know, the PowerPoint slides, the in instructor notes, we have test banks and things like that. And so a lot of us are kind of tied to those ancillary materials, which I refer to as the ancillary handcuffs. And it's really difficult to let go of those. So this was one of the things, these are the kinds of things that we were encountering countering at the beginning of our process. Okay. So this leads us to our search. Uh, we as archaeologists are very used to finding things. And in this, when we started thinking about using an OER, we visited all the usual sites back in 2017 when we started this process and then in 2018 as well. And what we found is there really wasn't a lot out there for anthropology at this time. And this pun is very much intended. We did dig very deep into this. We looked everywhere we possibly could. And what we found was that there were very specific sub-discipline texts that were coming out at this time. So something that was specifically for cultural anthropology or specifically for biological anthropology or for archaeology, there was almost absolutely nothing that was in existence. 
Um, the other thing that we found is when we started looking for anything that was in bioarchaeology or in biological anthropology, that there were some very problematic texts. And this is what goes along with what Amanda was talking about with vetting. Um, we found some that looked very good until we started reading into the subtext that was actually in there and finding that there were problems dealing with like evolutionary theory um, and other kinds of things that would come up as far as uh, like ideas about ancient civilizations and things like that. So again, vetting was very important in this process. Okay. So at this point, we were approached to join into the Open Education Resources Florida Challenge Grant that was handled by our library staff and also by um, CDL, our Center for Distributed Learning. Uh, what they presented to us is that we had a time frame of about one to one and a half years from start to finish for our project. And what we were going to be doing was developing an OER that we could actually use for our ANT 2000 that was more representative of what we actually do within our classroom. Uh, so what we did was we shared, we created some shared objectives and then we created an in-depth outline for each of the different parts. We decided that because we have multiple sections of this, we wanted to definitely use standardized chapters throughout all of our different sections of ANT 2000. So all of our students would be getting the same type of uh, experience in each one of the classes. The other thing that we did was we split up the sections and our work tasks between Michael and I, just like we would with any other type of uh, writing project. So along the way, what we discovered was there was an existing OER text on culture and linguistics by the Discipline Association, and it's pictured over here. And so we decided at that point, why reinvent or recreate? Because what we were really concerned with the most was the archaeology and the biological. And the other thing that we discovered in the archaeology and biological was that visuals were exceptionally important. Um, a lot of students had said that, yes, there are a few images in these chapters, but it doesn't really cover a lot of what we were covering over a, a much broader uh, part than just one chapter. Uh, the other thing that we found was that presentation and format were absolutely key. For students to use the textbooks, we wanted to have the presentation in a way that would be appealing to them and engaging to them but also thinking about the format of how they were going to actually be using the textbook itself. So in our OER, we had some very specific goals. We wanted readability and visuals like what we just talked about. But the other thing that we have to weigh out is how much do we actually include? Uh, we wanted more, but we wanted it to be a teaching tool and not the teacher in and of itself. So in other words, more of like a compatible aspect that would go along with what we were presenting in there. Um, then the other thing we wanted to think about was faculty implementation. Implementation, is this something that all of our faculty could actually use? And that comes into that discussion and um, adoption aspect that we were talking about with Amanda earlier. Uh, we also had to sit down and think about aligning our learning objectives across the board with our faculty. What exactly did we want our students to get out of this process? And then finally, after all of that, we had to go back and reevaluate again, what is enough? And eventually through talking with our colleagues, having other people look at it, uh, and then going through a lot of different uh, kind of reiterations, we found out that we found a very happy balance that was actually in there. So I had mentioned that access and uh, readability and things like that were very important. What we found, uh, for many of us, we remember that we were going into the period of COVID, uh, not short after 2019. And um, the access issues where we wanted it to be easily downloadable, we wanted it to be able to be used in any PDF viewer. And this became key during COVID because one of the things our students found was that they were able to access their textbook on their telephone, on their iPad, on anything because it was in that PDF format. And then also in the PDF format, it was very easy to make it accessibility compliant across the board. Um, use. We found out that our students were reading the textbook, not only just the summary that was at the end, not just the introduction, but they were actually digging into the material and reading it. Uh, we also were really concerned about visual learning. And so what we did was design a lot of materials to go along with that. 
And again, that aspect of the take along chapters. We have it uh, as an entire textbook, but with it being in a PDF, you can break that apart and students don't have to have the entire thing with them. They can just have a chapter at a time that they can download. So this brings us to a lot of the different kinds of learning tools that we had adopted in there. Uh, we wanted to visualize a lot of processes because this is one thing where we find that students were uh, really interested in, in trying to figure out how the steps were taking place. Um, I was amazed to find that there's a lot of creative common materials that are out there for us to be able to use. Uh, the DNA images that you see here came directly from uh, Wikipedia, and they're very accurate and very good. Uh, the other thing is we wanted to have key concept tables. And so what we did was we created these tables like what you see all the way in the over on the left hand side in the upper corner. Uh, these are kind of like inserts. So it's, it's a summary of what they're looking at and they can use those for uh, analysis and other kinds of things as they're reading through. Uh, there were a few different kinds of images that we did have to construct ourselves. And so one of the things that you can see here is the uh, comparison of the human and the chimpanzee skeleton. That was something that we did have to develop on our own. Uh, we really wanted to have concept review questions for them to use to kind of like get an idea of are they actually able to understand some of the materials that they're using? And these are self-evaluation or they could also be used directly in the classroom as like discussion points. And then finally, we had a glossary and an index that was being used. And um, the glossary was a really interesting thing to work through because a lot of the times we had to sit down and say, what actually is this? How are we presenting it? And what kind of definition do we wanna put forward? So that takes us to the final step that we went through, and that was peer reviews. Uh, I find that this is actually necessary for quality, and it, it really does give a little bit of legitimacy to your text as well. We selected some in-discipline reviewers who were also teaching intro courses, so they were familiar with what it is that we were actually looking at. Uh, this is very helpful at times. It lets you know if you're providing the clarity and understanding the concepts. A lot of the time when we read through the concept, we understand it, but when we have someone else read it, it does help to figure out if, if we're getting our points across. The other thing is they did recommend a lot of additional examples, which was helpful. Um, in some instances, it was uh, things that I hadn't actually really considered that were really good additional examples to add in. And the other thing is the visualization of the content. This was also very helpful. It let us know if the processes and images that we were supplying were actually good. Uh, it, but the same type of thing that we see in different kinds of professional publication, sometimes it was not as helpful, just like many reviews that we go through. Um, there were some comments of like the equivalent of I could do it better or I don't use that concept. But that's OK. That's the whole idea behind being able to create something that we are using. That adaption and that creativity goes into how we actually wanted it to work within what we're doing in, in our courses as well. All right, thank you, Lana. I'm gonna take over now and I see in the comments, uh, uh, Lisa wrote, and this is just at the perfect time that she loves the presentation because of the content, context and visuals. We'll get ready for some just boring text now. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and and at, just as you know, uh, so you know, uh, Lana, I mean, she did the lion's share of, of all of this. And she and Amy Denoyles and um, our previous chair and interim dean, Tasha Dupre, really kind of uh, uh, suggested that we do this and, and kind of push us into it. And I was such a curmudgeon the whole time. Um, but I, I think the result was was fantastic. And that's what I'm going to talk about now is assessing, you know, if it worked or not. Um, so basically what we did is, um, again, at, at the behest of uh, Amy Denoyles, is we, we started this uh, uh, scholarship of teaching and learning study, um, basically based off of uh, an, an anonymous survey that we gave to students in ANT 2000 uh, online. And uh, we did it for a, a number of years and a number of different uh, sections of the course. And then we also held focus groups. 
And I can't remember how many of those we did. So we, we you know, uh, once we did a survey, uh, we did follow ups. And then we, Lana and I were not involved because we were the authors of the text, but uh, Amy was so that, um, you know, they wouldn't feel pressured or anything uh, to, to being honest uh, as, as we're the ones kind of presenting them with this book in class. But um, we did, just so you know, we did offer extra credit which I have no problem with. Um, and if they didn't want to take the survey for extra credit, we had an alternative. So it wasn't like we were forcing them into to doing anything. Um, just as happenstance would have it, and Lana mentioned this, uh, this was the beginning of the time of COVID. Um, basically, you know, uh, fall 2019, everything shut down in spring 2019, right? Um, so we started the, the survey uh, we had nine sections of ANT 2000, as you can see here, different modalities. So two face-to-face, -face, two blended, or what we call mixed mode here at UCF, um, three completely online, and then two video. And I'm assuming these are kind of like the um, the COVID classes where they're, they're synchronous Zoom. Uh, you're, you're giving a Zoom lecture kind of thing, which is a, was a very weird format for me at the time. Uh, the survey was distributed to about 1,400 students, and we got a really good response rate, I think, because of the extra credit. But uh, I like to hope, too, that maybe the students wanted to contribute. Um, so 57 percent, you know, if you're if you're hitting 30 percent, you're doing really well. So uh, I think we did really, really well in that regard. Um, the the questions kind of fell into three buckets or categories. Uh, asking students their background in anthropology, uh, but also their background in um, textbook purchasing, because this was another initiative of um, UCF and the Center for Distributed Learning uh, and Amy, seeing how and why students buy texts um, and, and you know, figuring out if OER would help them. Um, the second bucket was functionality. You know, did, did it work? Was it, was it accessible? Was it user-friendly? And then lastly, content you know, what they thought of that. And we published our study in 2022 in Teaching and Learning Anthropology. So you can look that up if you want kind of more details on this. Um, here are the, some of the results, that first bucket, you know, the student background, um, their experience with anthropology. This is a, a GEP course. So very few people, students in the class had uh, previous experience with anthropology. You can see that 90% no courses, and this is normal. Um, I give out a little survey when I um, begin every class because I like to see the background of students, uh, how much detail I need to provide and background as I'm teaching the class. And this is pretty much average uh, for what for what I get when I do that survey. Um, you can see here, too, uh, this 2000 is, is an uphill battle, really. Um, there's relatively little knowledge beforehand and sometimes little interest. And you can see that here. Average interest is below 50% you know, before the, the class was taught, 45% uh, or no or low interest. Um, and they're taking it for many reasons. Maybe students are taking it just to fulfill that GEP requirement. They're a senior, they need one more. Um, they're a freshman, it fits into their schedule. So you're not necessarily getting students because they, they love the material. And so that's something else that the text had to do as well is um, kind of uh, uh, stimulate their interests. And I think, all of us who teach this class, you know, we're not just teaching anthropology. Our our main goal is to kind of inspire, you know, uh, and and teach to steal. We want majors, you know. So that that's another important aspect of the uh, of the OER. As far as their purchasing habits, this was pretty much in line with what UCF study had have found previously as well. Uh, cost is a big deal. 75% of them have in the past delayed buying their texts uh, due to cost because they needed a paycheck or whatever. Um, and 58 didn't buy them at all, you know, because they're too expensive. And especially for a GEP, a GEP class, if you're going to take this class once and even buying like a hundred dollar textbook, that's a lot. That's a big cost. Um, and reselling it, you're not going to get that much back. So, um, so that uh, kind of, second category of, of access and usability functionality. Um, you could see here, and I won't go through in detail uh, all of these numbers here, but generally uh, they really thought it was easy to acquire uh, and use. Um, 
uh, and, and accessible, uh, basically, um, easy to study from, I allow them to use it as a, you know, open book for taking their quiz as well. Um, and I'll mention here in just a moment, that the really, we found the best, um, I guess, medium for it was a PDF, a searchable PDF, so they could kind of look up terms and, and find things. And this is something that they could do while they're taking those open book quizzes. And yeah, maybe they're looking for answers, but they'll start reading along the way, you know, and, and it'll capture their interest. That's the idea, right? Um, uh, next, uh, the the value, especially because it is free. Um, they had some very, you know, high um, numbers in these categories as well. Uh, it's credible. It's a valuable text. It's relevant uh, to the course. Uh, it even increased their interest in the subject, you know, so that's great. Uh, increased enjoyment of the class. That I don't like that number, sixty-four percent. I think that could be a little bit higher, but I don't know. I don't know what you can do about that. Um, as well as challenging the way you think, you know, uh, texts. I think lecture and discussion maybe does that a little better, a little bit more. And I know again, everyone who teaches this class, even though it's a big lecture class, um, we we always kind of. Um, uh, want some kind of discussion and some kind of back and forth. So that happens uh, in the class as well. Um, and then lastly, we, we this was very important to us, um, how well we represented diverse viewpoints, especially in the visuals uh, and the content as well, the, the case studies. And uh, this is a, another area that was pretty challenging and something these numbers gave us pause to go back to the second edition to figure out, you know, how we could be more inclusive. And I'm not going to make excuses, but I am going to make excuses. <laughs> uh, a lot of the you know, material that we had in the text was very basic and foundational. Um, and, and unfortunately, in a way, there is very much a focus, you know, it's an androcentric male, Western, white uh, perspective, but it is something that we worked on for the second edition to bring in kind of more diverse voices uh, and visuals, even for the beginning of anthropology in, in the 1800s. And also, um, Lana was the one in charge of you know finding all the images and have them being uh, uh, licensable and you know able to show in the text. Uh, there are not you know we were I guess we were handcuffed by the diversity within the images that were available to us as well. Uh, so that that was difficult um, and and challenging as well, but something that we could work on. Uh, lastly, you know, how did the students do before and after the text was adopted? Um, we compared our scores. I want to say we went to the, the uh, UCF MIME portal to get the official data on um, uh, classes before and these classes after and the ones that the students were in who took the survey. Uh, and we were very pleased by these results, our DFW grades or the D letter grade, F letter grade and the withdrawal rate uh, had been almost cut in half. And, uh, you know, to, to me, 14, 15 percent, that's that's pretty high for a GP, GEP class in anthropology. You know, this is not um, necessarily we don't want it to be a weed out class. Again, it's kind of for inspiration to get people interested in anthropology and social science and that kind of perspective. So you can see the grades jump um, more A's and B's, uh, very much less D's and F's and withdrawals. Of course, there are still, you know, always going to be uh, people who get those F's and D's. But uh, we were, I think, able to, um, you know, bring those grades up by having a text that was available that they could actually afford and buy um, and usable, functional, that they could access very easily. Um, and that also aligned more with the way that we teach in class with the lectures as well. And that gave us the ability uh, to do that. Um, so overall, they were pretty satisfied, the students. And what they asked us to do was, even though we thought there were a lot of images, they wanted even more. So in the second edition, um, there were a lot more uh, images, or even I want to say the third edition, technically, I think it would be. Um, we also tried to represent more diversity and case studies, like Lana was saying. Uh, at first, we, you know, we didn't want to put a lot of case studies. We wanted kind of more foundational concepts and then let instructors 
add their own case studies. And that's where they could kind of have their academic freedom to choose what, what they were interested in. But the students still wanted more. Uh, so we gave them a little bit more, uh, some kind of uh, highlights uh, from different different um, individuals and, and at UCF as well. Um, and the issue is really still that kind of last bullet there. Uh, this is a very difficult text to write and a difficult class to teach because of the diversity of students and their career levels uh, at UCF and their, their cultural backgrounds and their experience and academic experience. So that's always still going to be a little bit um, of a challenge. Um, finally, in terms of formatting, something that we recognize that worked and didn't work, and Lana spoke about this a little bit already, um, PDF seemed like the best option. And I got to tell you, again, like I'm, I'm really um, giving Lana the kudos, but she is a PDF master. She can get a PDF into the smallest file size. I don't think I would have been able to um, submit my promotion binder without her because she was able to help me get it down to the amount that they allowed. Uh, so you can get it down pretty small and it's, it's readable, it's searchable. HTML did not work at all. We had it up on stars as an HTML for a while. It was really bad. Um, those reader programs are kind of clumsy too. Uh, and you need to have one of them aside from Adobe. So it seems, it seems like PDF was the, the best option. Um, and as you can see there, you know, there's um, the grades were grades were up, DFWs were down. Um, we even got some public shout outs on on uh, forums like like Reddit about uh, how the instructors who use this text and created it care about and value their their students and their financial situations. And that's really important to us, too, um, having the students recognize that we do think about them and um uh, are concerned, you know, that that they're going to do well in the class. And I'll I'll leave this slide, Alana, if you want to jump in again, uh, because you had a lot to do with this uh, second or technically third edition here. Sure. Um, so as Mike said, we had a lot of students who were asking for more images. So our edition that we're using now has 100 plus more images that are actually in it. We did introduce some of those uh, case studies. Uh, the other thing is, is because of some of the different kinds of OERs of the adaptability, what we decided to do was use that initial text that we were using for the cultural chapters and move that into our GEP for cultural anthropology, which has been fantastic there. And then this created us an open um, kind of arena to adapt some other chapters to put in. And now we have one text with uh, the archaeology, the biological, and our eight new chapters of uh, cultural anthropology that's actually in there. The other thing that we've done is develop some department faculty profiles that are going in there. You can see one in the upper right hand corner. And we've also have on uh, the sections where we have embedded career center links as well. So again, our idea is to steal. And so we're interesting, you know, we're getting students interested in what they can do with the career in anthropology. Okay. Great. I think I'm going to uh, hand it off now to um, Sandra. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Okay, perfect. Um, so I wanted to highlight this uh, image. This was taken last year. Um, our department was recognized we, uh, for the group award for the uh, affordable instructional materials um, uh, award. Oh, sorry. Um, and you can see there's faculty here. The provost came, uh, Amy Denoyles, our instructional designer is also shown here and our chair is shown here. Um, and the AIM awards are essentially, there's individual awards and group awards for faculty who adopt low to no cost materials for their courses. And our department was recognized because of the efforts uh, made not only in our general uh, anthropology class, but across our general education program. So um, Mike and um, Lana and Amanda use the terms GEP so it's the general education program. These are courses that um, mostly non-majors take to fulfill their general education requirements. 
Uh, so ANT 2000 is one of those courses. Um, you can see the numbers here. You know, we teach multiple sections per term, hundreds of students. Uh, we also have a gen ed that is cultural anthropology, multiple sections, hundreds of students. And our biggest uh, general education course is human species. And you can see we can teach upwards of, you know, thousands of students uh, per term. In terms of the timeline, because ANT 2000 was so successful, um, you know, Mike and Lana were able to show the great success of this type of course material. Um, we decided to think as a, decided to sort of approach this on, on a department level of where else could we employ OERs uh, in our other courses, specifically targeting gen ed courses, because students come from all over the university they're taking the class not because they want to, they have to take a gen ed uh, in these particular sections. So how could we make it kind of better for them? And you can see that adapting or adopting or creating OERs, especially at the department level, takes a lot of time. Um, so Mike and Lana started with their sections of their class in 2017, 2018. Uh, we started discussions um, just after COVID or during COVID of when are we going to adopt OERs for these other classes um, till finally full adoption in uh, spring 23 for all three of our general education courses. Um, I will say that some faculty were immediately on board with adopting OERs. So they adopted these materials prior to the required adoption date. <laughs> And then we had to kind of grab some stragglers at the end. So there was a little bit of resistance um, at the department level for adopting OERs kind of right away. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later of, you know, if you're in a position where you're working with faculty and kind of forcing them, telling them we are, we are doing this, this is what we're doing, you have to set a realistic timeline for them to be able to uh, adapt their courses for that. Um, so because of the success of ANT 2000, we now have um, across all of our general education courses, all open access materials, all OER materials. Um, Lana showed the perspectives, uh, the explorations is a kind of newer, I think it's in the second edition now that we use for human species. And then you can see Mike and Lana's um, OER for uh, ANT 2000. Now this is the slide that kind of blows everybody away. Um, the cost saving for students. So if you have a faculty member that is just really resistant, that you know doesn't want to do the work, Amanda mentioned, you know, on the front end, it is a lot of work to change over whenever you switch to a new edition or a new textbook. These numbers really show the impact um, that it has on students. Um, I think that these numbers kind of undersell the actual impact because it doesn't account for those faculty who were early adopters. But these data show um, once all sections of all of those courses adopted OER materials, how much money students saved. So half a million to a million and a half dollars. And this is just for since like spring 23, spring 22. So really, really big savings for students. And it can make a huge difference in a student's life if they have to spend that $165 on food instead of a textbook or gas for their car instead of their book. So it really benefits students in a lot of ways, right? It frees up their finances. Um, it removes price barriers. We know a lot of students just don't buy the book because they can't afford it. Well, this completely removes that barrier for them. Um, and it also expands access. Like Mike said, um, you know, students are more likely to read the course materials if they're free, if they're available, if they don't have to wait for financial aid to buy their books. And then those materials are available immediately from the first day of class. Um, the uh, uh, press books can be downloaded from a website. Um, chapters can also be embedded within web courses or whatever learning platform um, you're using in your in your class, you know, either as a full document or single PDFs. Um, one of the things that um, Lana found in particular is that she had a lot of students in her online section that were deployed military students. 
um, and they could download, you know, one chapter at a time, given their bandwidth, <laughs> wherever they were at. So it was really accessible for those students as well. Um, a lot of the OERs are already um, uh, compliant for digital accessibility. Um, that is definitely something if you're thinking about um, adopting or adapting these materials to make sure that you're working with your libraries and your instructional designers to ensure that they are compliant. Okay. Um, we did have resistance uh, from some faculty um, because it is a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work when you are transitioning to new course materials. It might mean you have to redo lectures. It might mean you have to redo, um, you know, your test banks, um, but it is a lot of work on the front end for benefits on the back end, like we've seen. Um, OERs can be highly customizable, right? Whenever I was teaching a class and I made a student buy a $90 textbook, I felt like they needed to use the whole book, even if I didn't like certain chapters. Um, so with OER free materials, you can kind of use the sections that you want and ditch the ones that you don't. Um, I think creating a realistic, feasible timeline for adoption for your faculty is really, really important. We did this phased in approach uh, because we teach multiple sections, multiple different instructors, and sometimes those instructors change every semester. So it's really important to communicate with the faculty. Listen, you have three semesters, you have four semesters, this is the deadline, you have to switch over and then follow up with those faculty to make sure that those are the materials that they're actually using in their class. Um, we already talked about the sort of scalability and sort of ease of access to these kinds of materials. Oftentimes the OERs are easy to distribute. They work on multi -devi multiple devices on lots of different formats. One of the things that we found is students also kind of um, uh, course shop for course materials. They look at the different sections of the class to see how much those course materials cost and they'll choose the ones that have OERs. Um, so uh, course materials are listed on our UCF bookstore website. And we also have a function um, in our web courses where we can preview the syllabus the students can also see the syllabus um, and see that the materials are low to no cost. Um, one of the great benefits of OERs, um, especially those that can be adapted, is that they can be updated really quickly. And Lana kind of mentioned this with biological anthropology that you know there's a lot of new finds, there's a lot of new discoveries that need to be integrated into the OERs. This can be done really easily instead of waiting two years for a new edition of a textbook and then actually you know, making the students pay more for that new edition. And what we found in some of the OERs, at least for anthropology, is that some of the new editions actually include ancillary materials. So lab books, test banks, uh, some basic PowerPoints, but oftentimes you can just modify the things that you already have to help it supplement those OERs or have the OER supplement what you already have created. Um, I don't know if desk copies are still a thing, but uh, we don't have to buy desk copies for our GTAs. Uh, so it also saves the department money um, on that end. Okay. So um, that's all I have. And I think we have time for questions, maybe two yeah. minutes. Yeah, <laughs> we've got about two minutes left for any questions. There haven't been any in the chat, but we can start there or anyone can unmute. Uh, Lana, it looks like uh, you and Mike have a question. How do you, how do people find your book? <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna look up the link for it really quickly and post it in there. Still got about a minute for any questions. There in the chat, um, have you encountered students making alternate language options um, as an HSI? I find some of my students prefer the text reading in native lingua, especially Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, 
Uh, as far as I know, and Lon and Mike, maybe you can, um, since you created the OER, I don't think that we have had any requests from students um, uh, requesting the, the book in a different language. But like I do know be... they're, they're, they are, um, it's because of the accessibility of these, they, they are capable of being translated, but I've not personally had a student email me for a Spanish version of, you know, for example, the explorations book that I use in 2511, the OER. Um, but I think because they are so accessible for things like screen readers, et cetera, that it is easily translatable for those students. And that might be why we don't hear from them. And that puts us right to time. Thank you so much for this presentation. This was really wonderful. Um, coming up next at about one o'clock, we have a drop-in session where Karen Tinsley Kim and Kevin Corcoran will be answering questions about accessibility and open education, which fits really well into this presentation. So thank you for easing our transitions, everyone. And thank you to all the participants and looking forward to more. <laughs>